very important, a very, very important show today to talk about masculinity and where it's going. Being a man, it's very important. Being a man is very hard. Uh, when you hear the word moose, you don't know whether to shoot it, eat it, or put it in your hair. Uh, complex, the world. <laughs> it's a serious subject, though. And um, I've been writing about it a little bit, as has my very, very accomplished guest today, Marianne Franks, who is a Rhodes Scholar, a professor uh, of law at the University of Miami, a graduate of Harvard Law School. She and I were both featured on a program that was, like this subject, supposed to be serious, but almost as unserious as, uh, as I just made it out to be. When we were invited last week to be on the Huffington Post Live program and found ourselves shouted down by an unnamed uh, random passerby who was given a camera and a microphone. And um, Marianne and I wanted to get together and explore some of the questions we never had the chance uh, to discuss about the role of uh, the the real and serious role of um, gender roles in American society, particularly, and where they're going, and what it really means to us as societies and uh, employers and um, all all manner of institutions. So, hello, Marianne. How are you today? I'm doing really well, thank you. So, what is your? Um, I, I I read your CV and I read um, you've got any number of of, of legal. Um, of legal publications on the on the role of gender and where masculinity is going and and, and can you just tell us some of your I mean you've you've studied so much what led to this uh, this particular part of your intellectual life I think for many years I've been fascinated with the question of why people do bad things it's a pretty simple question but a pretty on the other hand very complex question once you start to try to unravel it so I started out by looking at things like anti-Semitism, racism against black people in the United States, uh, propaganda, and then started to realize that unfortunately there are so many different subjects or topics one could address when thinking about why people do bad things. And increasingly I've been focusing on the question of gender and increasingly on the question of what it means to have an intersection between masculinity, however defined, and aggression and uh, violence. And so that's been something I've been working on for several years now. All right. So, and, and do you teach any classes uh, that I think I looked at some of your course schedule? Do yeah. you do you teach a class on on the role of gender in in crime or gender in violence, or how do you split that? Not up? not really. I, I teach straightforward classes. I teach criminal procedure, which is all mm -hmm. about what the cops can and can't do to you. Uh, criminal law, and I teach family law. So all of these are subjects where gender roles certainly play a very significant type. Of, I guess you could say they have quite a bit of influence in the ways that our laws are written and the expectations we have, and particularly in family law. But I do occasionally also teach a seminar on bias, and that does cover a lot of the gender dimensions um, question, but also race, also class, also many other issues that go into our perceptions of the world and the way that we structure the world according to law and social norms. Hmm. So when you say you talk about um, the role of gender in... Um in doing bad things, or your overarching, well, really the legal profession is, you know, the overarching theme in justice is um, what's a bad thing and what do we do about people when they do bad things? How do we mm -hmm. handle that? Um, now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pitch you a softball here based on stats that I already know pretty well for having studied gun violence in the United States, mm -hmm. but are men more likely to do uh, bad things when it comes to violence? When we're talking about physical violence, absolutely yes. I mean, all the statistics do show that the majority of violent crime is committed by men, majority of domestic violence, the majority of sexual assaults. So yes, we're looking at a pretty heavy skew in terms of gender. Yeah, that, that dovetails with my own, my own research um, that came up after the most recent shooting of the Navy Yard, and I'd gotten my, my umpteenth uh, set of hate mail for asserting in, in a public forum that uh, having a society doused in firearms everywhere actually leads to firearms being used more correctly and I heard my um, my 50th uh, stupid argument about how really more guns actually equals more safety and I just immersed myself in all the the statistics and I too found that uh, that the, the vast majority of, of, of perpetrators of murder are men the vast majority of, of victims of murder mm -hmm. are men they mostly use guns and the, but then men come up 
and men come up all the time and you know the thing that got me into this more recently looking at masculinity has was to to look at the cold and crazy eyes of men under 30 who were committing the most you know the yeah. most the splashiest the mass murders um and so i think this has led both of us to this uh this idea that maybe th there's an issue with with manhood itself how do you how do you take that I think in much the same way that, that you are looking at the situation, I think one of the things that's been challenging for the question of masculinity or of manhood is that we take it almost as a given that men commit the majority of violence. It's almost as though we take it as a kind of, uh, we don't even talk about the fact that when we're looking at spree shooters, for instance, because they get an awful lot of attention, they're almost all male. And no one seems to be, very few people seem to be pointing this out and trying to say, look, we're a society that tries to draw stereotypes and conclusions from everything, and yet we're overlooking the fact that spree shooters are almost always male, they're almost always white, they're almost always of a certain age, and that seems very strange that we're not paying more attention to the male part of the, this issue. So I think that, yes, we need to start there. We need to start thinking about the fact that when we look at really horrific crimes, when we look at the kinds of actions that have no social value but have tremendous social cost, why are so many men not only engaging in this type of activity, but also seem to think that it means that it makes them men, that it somehow is wrapped up in the idea and the identity of what it means to be a man. So this is, now you say that a, there's a certain age and a, and a certain uh, gender and often a certain ethnicities with the, the spree shooters. What's, what's the age in your, in, 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 in your travels, in your studies? What, did, what have you seen the age as? They've mostly been fairly young, so we're talking about people who are under the age of 30 in most cases. That, you know, again, that, that matches a lot of what, what I saw, certainly. And, um, you know, I, I think there's a professor at Yale who's been doing a, a, a you know, statistical analysis of, vi of mass violence, this very splashy, media-friendly violence that's been out there. And the, the statistical average of the, the amount of time between these spree shootings has been compressing mm -hmm. in in the last ten years. That um, you know one of the first of these um, wide you know these multiple killings was in the 1940s. The next one was in about 1960, and then 70, 80, 90 to the 2000s. It's it's getting much choppier. So the trend line seems to be suggesting that this kind of lashing out at society type violence is increasing in frequency. It certainly seems to be, and that's not even counting all the attempts that have been, you know, luckily foiled. I mean, there have been several attempts at mass shootings. When we've seen there was that incredible case, uh, her name is escaping me now, but there was essentially a woman who was able to talk the man down from before he in ended up shooting an entire elementary school. He brought in all these weapons. He had a stockpile of guns. It was going to be another new town, and she was able to actually talk to him a little bit and try to figure out what his motivations were and the police were able to arrest him. So not just in terms of the completed free shootings but also the attempts and how many times we've seen people, uh, these young men, at least think that this is something that they want to plan to do or going to talk about doing and in some cases unfortunately succeed in doing. And added to that the spate of other horrific media uh, sort of saturated kinds of crimes the types of gang, uh, the gang rapes and sexual assaults of increasingly younger and younger victims videotaping it and putting it online. So there, there again, I think we're seeing a dimension where this is almost exclusively a male type of crime. It's a male type of uh, bonding exercise in some of these cases. And it's becoming so, and this is the part I was talking about, about the showiness of it and the fact that it seems to be not, I commit a crime or I have an impulse and I'm ashamed of it, but I'm proud of it. I'm, I'm sexually assaulting a young girl and I'm putting it on videotape and I'm going to send it all around so that she can be humiliated for the rest of her life. That's, that's, uh, you see these men sharing these pictures with their friends. You see them saying you know, how much of a man they are because they were able to do this. That's a pretty bad sign about what some of these people are thinking masculinity is supposed to look like. So you've done work on uh, on revenge porn. Is that mm -hmm. I've seen you in conjunction with some of those shows. Can you give me an overview of what that... Um, what that and you know particularly any data in, in terms of prevalence and how how much more that's occurring these days yeah so the term is unfortunate the revenge porn term is something that the, the media has chosen to use because it's kind of a catchy way of talking about what is only one category of the kind of material that I'm actually referring to so if we think about non-consensual pornography as a bigger category of conduct that's anything from sexually assaulting someone and videotaping them 
to um, someone voluntarily giving a sex tape to someone or giving a sexy picture to someone and that person then taking that picture and uploading it to a, a, a porn site or sending it to her parents or sending it to her boss. So it's a big category. It can include uh, not just recordings that are made without consent but also recordings made with consent and then used beyond the, the terms of that relationship. So it's, it's, I mean, yeah, go ahead, sorry. I mean, it's, a, it's sort of a, the, the internet and media you know, a category of uh, humiliation of women, not through in f physical violence at the moment, but through reputational violence. Right. So what it speaks to kind of broadly is a sense of the, the, the fact that we have in the society still this tendency to punish women through and by sex. So the idea even that it's possible to ruin a woman's reputation by releasing a picture of her, and that says something very, very sad about our society, that that's something that would be considered so shameful. But it's a, certainly a type of domestic violence in many cases, intimate partner violence, when we do have these situations where these were consensual pictures and consensual videos, and then because one member of that couple, and it is almost always, at least in the cases we've seen so far, the male of the couple that decides, well, she doesn't want to be with me anymore, I'm going to show her, I'm going to make sure that she's miserable for the rest of her life, takes something that was given to him in confidence and intimacy and trust and uses it to destroy her. I mean, that is that is a very, very strange conception of what it means to be a man, not only because of how much destruction it causes, but because we're really looking at someone who can't get over a breakup, someone who's doing this because he doesn't have control and access anymore to someone who has moved on or doesn't, isn't interested in him anymore, and this is the way that he chooses to handle it. So once more, we've got the, um, the male who has lost stature, who has lost rank, uh, and, and feels inferior, and this is a way to lash out. Right. Whew. Damn, that's ugly. It is. Um, so I, I want to dovetail with that with something that, I, uh, that I've been studying. Um, I have a, a piece, uh, you know, I've both a, a speech and some ongoing research about the future of branding in the United States and how advertising communicates. And if you look at 100 years of, of branding, it was very, very rudimentary in 1890 and 1900, you'd have ads for shoes, get them here. Mm -hmm. They're there. Get shoes. Um, and, you know, on to minor descriptions of the product, too. As the decades come on, you have more and more description of the, the, the consumer. As in, well, here's, you're this kind of person, you'll buy this kind of product. Mm -hmm. That had to be evolved. And, you know, this goes on, you know, kind of up until the, um, you know, the, 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 the pinnacle of this is the Mac and PC guy. This guy's a Mac, this guy's a PC. You mm -hmm. can see what kind of people they are, and you can decide which one you want to be associated with, um, based on on who you are. And now we've legged over, we've we've crossed this threshold, and to this other type of completely nihilistic branding, particularly where males are the the butt of the joke, you know, almost 100% of the time, where the females are not shown to be uh, weak and in need of uh, assistance. They're usually the choosy ones that the, the companies have to cozy up to to get them to make the right purchase, which makes sense because 95% of purchases in the home are made by the female mm -hmm. of the home. And um, the men are, are referred to, are just depicted to be complete schmucks. They are, they are feckless. They are hapless. Um, they're usually not depicted in, um, you know, to be very physically attractive unless it's a Fabio type of over-the-top, super sexy kind of thing in a small percentage of, of commercials. And you have often the males, particularly younger males now, shown to be, you know, schlubby um, men without a whole lot of, of, of of stature, and I, you know, in my talks, I bring out a commercial from Doritos where there's kids l licking the orange paste off of Doritos bags off their boss's hands, and um, the pet, the, the the ad for Pepsi Max, which is sort of an alpha and beta male thing, where the kid hasn't he's fat and unattractive, but he flings the can of Pepsi at the crotch of the other guy. Which I, it's just hard to, it's hard to, what are you trying to say here? And down to the bottom of the barrel, which is the, the Dodge Charger, men staring oh, yeah. into the camera, you have no life, might as well drive around the suburbs in our car, sucker. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, in, in, in your opinion, or is that just scratching, you know, 
at a wound that's already there? Are are there that many men in distress, particularly in the United <laughs> States? Pakistan and Japan have their own thing, so we just keep it on mm -hmm. the U.S. You know, are you are men in the U.S. in in, in that kind of uh, in that much crisis? There's a lot going on there, I think, in these advertisements. I mean, as you well know, there's not necessarily going to be a concern for the realness of any actual misery or suffering or uh, discomfort that these men might actually be experiencing that these commercials might be kind of glancingly getting at, but that's not really what they're trying to do. They're trying to sell products and they're trying to do it in a way that they think will work. And what's so interesting about you bringing up these examples is that I think it's really undeniable when you look at commercials like your examples um, that these are really very insulting commercials to men. They are really presenting a perception of men as weak, as stupid, as incapable, as sad, as depressed, as emasculated. There are all these types of stereotypes that are really, really offensive. And what's so odd about that is not is the fact that the people who are in charge of these types of images and this type of advertising are primarily male. I mean, men do dominate at the advertising industry still, and that so it, it it makes us have to ask the question: Why are the people who are you know in charge of these campaigns portraying men this way? And the reason why that's particularly important to point out, I think, is because as you might know, there are many so-called men's rights activists who cite the fact that men are portrayed this way in TV shows and commercials and in other ways as evidence that feminism has emasculated the world and that there, you know, this is evidenced by these commercials and we're showing this and they seem to really overlook the point that there's no feminist who would approve of these commercials and it's not women who are creating these commercials. This is a complex thing that some men somewhere with a lot of power have decided is the way they want to portray men. Now that being said, what is it tapping into? It's probably tapping into a lot of alienation. It's probably tapping into a lot of a sense of distress, disorientation, because we are living in very different times, especially for men. One can certainly imagine how disorienting it might be for someone who has been raised in a culture that up till now has said, as a given, the fact that you are male means that it com you come with all these entitlements. There are all sorts of unearned privileges that accompany your, the fact of your gender that you don't have to work for, that you didn't have to justify. And now you're living in a time where they're slowly being picked off one by one. It's no longer going to be the case that you can dominate in the workplace. Uh, it used to be the case that in our society, we just excluded women completely. So that made it easy on men. They didn't have to worry if they were as good as a woman because they, they, they never had to compete with her. Now they do, and now it's kind of a serious question of can I be beaten by a woman? Now women, women are entering professional sports. Now women are doing really everything that men can do, and they are making their own money, in some cases making more money. And this is throwing into confusion all the things that I think for hundreds of years our society has said, men, these things belong to you and they can't be taken away. So I do think those commercials are tapping into that, but they're doing nothing good with that sense of distress. Hmm. And, and you know, when you say the, that there are, um, there are privileges that are, are being taken away, you know, the, the other side of that trade is there's privileges being taken away, but the expectations are not taken away in, um, in equal measure. There is very few. Um, there's very few social mechanisms that have equalized along with the equalization of, of economic power. I'll just you know I'm I'm 39. I've been married for seven years now, uh, seven wonderful years. And uh, but I do still remember what it was like to date. And uh, mm -hmm. I was you know dating. Well, I was as a child of the 70s and 80s. Uh, you know was, you know well into the being raised by. Um, women, where the rights of women were increasing all the time, and feminism was on people's minds, and you know, uh, getting you know, kids then were being guided by their mother's generation to be, you know, to not have the same prejudices of the prior generation. And I was certainly part of that, but certainly by the time I was thirty, and you know, going on dates and the courtship ritual, there was it wasn't you know, guys did not hu huddle around and go, well, did she pay for dinner? No, you're going to pay for dinner. Um, you know, are you going to be? Are, you know, you're still judged as a man on. Well, you know, if you're dealing with a woman of, from a certain socioeconomic class, or do you appear that you're going to have a similar uh, career trajectory? Um, you know, are you going to be able to carry the household on that? And whether or not the women are thinking that, it's almost you know. This is not to point fingers at who, who's thinking it. It's you know this is obviously a complex uh, relationship between multiple generations, mm -hmm. two genders, and different cultures in different parts of the country and and whatnot. And you know we definitely because of of, of um, 
you know, macroeconomic forces in employment, especially the removal, the increasing removal of the um, W-2 um, 40 hour a week full-time employment plus benefits giving you a, a rock solid status in society that tells you who you are you know we've been taking that away because it's very advantageous for a lot of business models um, we take that away but we don't take away the expectation of men to be able to meet that and when you look particularly at um, the rural part of America where light manufacturing has been taken out, mm -hmm. where farming represents less GDP than it ever did, and more of it is centralized in cities. Um, and your, uh, your point about the, um, the ad agencies being mostly run by men, you know, talking about, you know, trying to sell products from corporations, the owners and managers of which are largely men, using as their messaging denigration to masculinity, it, you know, you get this really complex picture very quickly of, wait a minute, it's, there's a lot of expectations still made of men, and the broader, not, you know, the, econ the economy as a whole and then the culture in specific make it pretty hard to add up to all those to all those things. Um, it's harder and harder to get a job, but you can still get a handgun. This is true. I, I do think that there are certain, I mean, as you point out, social norms take some time to shift, and it's, I certainly don't disagree with the idea that when you're at a moment of tremendous cultural and social shift, are there going to be some outdated perceptions that are still going to be restrictive for people? I think that's certainly true. There are the, the question even about as 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 simple as who pays for dinner. Now it's really difficult to know what to make of that sociologically, right? Because if we say, well, is is it women who are expecting men to pay and are are going to look askance if you can't? I'm not sure that it is. But regardless, the point is, if there is a bad social norm, if there are expectations that are grounded in in gender expectations as opposed to making sense, right? Because one would imagine that if you're engaged in an activity with someone, the best way to think about the payment for that would just be to ask who is in a better position to pay, can people pay equally, who asked the other person. These are all sensible questions to ask. It doesn't seem to make any sense to say he should pay because he's a male, she should pay because she's a woman. None of those things seem to make sense. So I think the best perspective to take on all of those is to ask, well, who is, whose interests are benefited by asking stupid questions like that? Who is really trying to hold on to this perception that men need to have this type of status to define themselves? Because mm -hmm. I think it's really key to focus on saying, well, let's just talk about all these situations as though we really did want a better society and we want to make it better for people to do good things as opposed to bad. One of the examples I bring up is the fact that we're the only country, the only civilized country, that doesn't have any form of paid parental leave. That's a huge problem and everybody should be complaining about that. Anybody who thinks that kids are actually important, anybody who actually thinks that child rearing is important should be arguing about this. Everybody in this country should be able to work a job, feed their family, and actually spend time with that family. And if we cared about that as a society, we would make certain different choices. So I certainly am in favor of criticizing, highlighting, pointing out all the norms that are making us more miserable, are, are restricting us to roles that are outdated, that maybe never made any sense to begin with. So I think that it's important for us to call them out wherever we see them and not to falsely attribute them to any one force or another, but to say who's controlling that interest, just like with the advertisers. It's not some group of cackling women who are like, I really want that Dodge commercial to air. It's clearly not that. There are real corporate interests that you can trace. Same thing is going to be true in politics. Same thing is going to be true in law. Who is making these laws? Who is enforcing these norms? And if we don't like them, shouldn't we be trying to stop them? So this is this is interesting. You know, when we were brie uh, briefly on a uh, on a talk show the other day, um, some words came up regarding feminism. Now it's very funny. I have not. You know, the only reference I made to feminism was a reference to events that happened four decades ago, and I don't think I've heard you make a single. You know, you you you're making societal criticisms here talking about some needs that the social interaction uh, could be improved by, you know, some things we should do as a, as a culture. Uh, but it's not coming specifically from, um, from the feminine perspective necessarily. It seems like a top-down thing. Is this, you know, is feminism kind of an old framework? Is it still operational in, in your view? It's a tricky question because so many people seem to have different perceptions about what feminism actually means. I maybe have a very simplistic one, which is just that feminism is there as an important corrective to society that was overwhelmingly run and dominated by male interests. 
you need a corrective that actually focuses on something other than male interest to be able to fix that. That doesn't mean, and is never meant for me or for any of the feminists that I admire, that there's some sort of gender hierarchy that we want to flip. It's the notion of hierarchy itself that we want to dismantle. That is to say, you shouldn't be able to get privileges because you're a man. You shouldn't be able to get privileges because you're a woman. We should be able to ask the question that, departing from any of those constrictive and restrictive roles, what, is, what makes most sense here in terms of being good people, in terms of being a good society? Those are the questions we have to ask. That, to me, is, is all that feminism is doing. It looks as though it's targeting male behavior and male action because that's what the world is. The status quo is still very much male-dominated. But the question has never been, we want to reverse a hierarchy and put women on top. It's, in any sense, it's just about really trying to make the, ask the most sensible questions about society and not be constrained by women ought to do this and men ought to do that. So you're making a commentary really about, um, uh, about meritocracy there. Which is that you know if you're not if you're not basing your your societal rank based on um, pre-existing um, genitals, for example, um, if you know which sounds when you put it that way sounds uh, about as ridiculous as it works out. <laughs> um, you know if you're not basing uh, if you don't have a testicle-based society, and you move on to cognitive ability and good ideas and scientific. Mm -hmm. ability and artistic ability and whatnot. You're really kind of getting at this thing called meritocracy. Um, meritocracy's been having a, a pretty tough time functioning these days as we move more in the direction of um, of uh, sort of a, what my my good friend Sarah Kenzior here in town talks about um, the prestige economy. The instead of um, just having people, uh, you know, get get jobs and positions in society because of their their innate skill. Um, you know, we're just taking whoever's got the top brand name attached to them, and uh, and running with that. And that goes through that goes in consultancies, McKinsey on top, and you know, it goes for universities and 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 all the rest. So, are we getting back down to a you know, if we're trying to get to a place where it doesn't really matter where you are in terms of your gender, we're looking so that the rank isn't so unequal based on ridiculous or, you know, th things that don't have anything to do with talent. So is this, you know, about the, the larger drive for, uh, you know, a meritocracy in our culture? I think you could characterize it that way. The only, the only problem, of course, is that meritocracy itself as a term and as a concept is also pretty contested. So mm. when we think about how, in the affirmative action debates, for instance, if you think about how, if you really went to what most people consider to be a straight-out meritocracy, which is how did you score on certain tests, you end up with schools full of Asians and nobody else. That's an interesting observation, right? That's we all need to accept that, right? Because it, it, but that doesn't mean that that's the beginning or the end of what meritocracy maybe could mean. It means it's, and, I, and I'm sorry to get a little um, highfalutin about this, but it really is about highfalutin, <laughs> highly. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this for a second, but to talk a little bit about Aristotle because I think it's relevant. The, the the Aristotelian question being, what is the purpose of any given institution? What is the purpose of any given project or practice? We don't know whether somebody is right for a job or right for a school or deserves to be at a university if we haven't done some very hard thinking about what's the purpose of a university. Is it just to be able to get a bunch of people who are good at tests to do other things? Or do we actually think that there's something more expressive about the experience of a university, something about diverse viewpoints, something about coming from different walks of life, something about how if you grew up in um, a trailer park that there's something that you might have never had the chance to learn or be able to do if you grew up in the inner city of Chicago there are certain things that you are good at but not at others we need to be asking those questions and we need to be very honest about what answers we're coming up with so I mean you have these debates and things like it sounds maybe a little frivolous but I used to teach a course on this uh, with Michael Sandel at, at Harvard called Justice very very uh, big class in, in all sorts of ways and we asked the question of you know when you think about when there was a controversy in golf over whether or not you should be able to use a cart, right, because we, you had a, a, a player who, who wasn't able to walk, he wasn't able to do the whole walking uh, part that, of golf that was required of him. And the question was, well, we have to ask the question of whether golf essentially involves walking or not, whether we think the telos of golf involves the walking or whether or not it's really just everything else. And the same thing was about uh, handicapped, uh, sorry, uh, cheerleaders who were in wheelchairs, whether or not they could still be cheerleaders. You have to ask the question, well, what does it mean to be a cheerleader and whether or not having certain types of physical capabilities is what's required or if it's something else. 
I think these are good questions to ask that really what's wrong with us so far is that we're not asking those questions. We talk about universities, we talk about jobs, we talk about institutions as if their goal, as if their purpose was evident. In many cases it's not. So once we start asking that question, what makes a good university? What makes a good place of employment? What makes a good school? What makes a good home? What makes a good neighborhood? That's when we can start saying, well, who is suited to be here and what kind of skills should we cultivate? Oh man, you've just you've just dug into this the the big this, the overarching issues here where you've got you know, we have a society that's changed largely because of technology and some major demographic shifts. We got you know, gen the boomers are twice the size of, of Generation X, 20th century ideologies meeting 21st century realities. You know, we've got a huge mismatch in institutions, institutions that are not really built for what we're doing, and we still are pulling the levers on those institutions, and we might get into um, a discussion of, you know, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank. You know, what what have they done for, for us lately? You know, if your name is Jamie Dimon and you're the CEO of uh, J.P. Morgan, you say, well, a lot. You know, they've enabled mm -hmm. our industry to continue being essentially speculators, and they get a free stockpile of money from a central source. And, if you know, you can run any store if the, the stock is free. It's pretty easy to run a good business mm -hmm. model. They've, they're doing great for the rest of us. We're not sure what we get out of a Federal Reserve. So then, what is the question whether Ben Bernanke is good at it or bad at it if the institution itself doesn't really do a lot for, you know, uh, the, you know the good folks in rural America or, you know, or even in Manhattan or school teachers? The institution is serving this weird uh, function. Universities right now, you've got, you know, kids that are paying $165,000 for in a credential that is not a guarantee for for um, employment, might not give them the right skills, or just the way the labor market is set up right now for a variety of reasons, just doesn't match coming out of that institution into the next uh, institution. Healthcare, we're going to attach your health, your your ability to see a doctor uh, and get preventative care. We're going to attach that to whether you got out of college and got to get a job, or didn't go mm -hmm. to college and tried for a job, or you can work three jobs and you still don't have a doctor. We've got these institutions all over the place that just aren't really um, matched up for what they're they're supposed to be doing. And you're talking about well, wait a minute before we, you know, it's it's funny just this this place that you've led this to to get stuck in the gender decision about well should a guy get hired or should a woman stay at home with her little kiddos when you've got well, wait a minute what's a university supposed to do? For our society, mm -hmm. like to get stuck in the who you know who's got what reproductive organs, boy, it makes that sound very juvenile very quickly. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think that's because it, it really is. It's the wrong analysis to be using for these very complicated questions because child rearing, the home, the family, all these things call for the same questions. It seems obvious to a lot of people what it means to have a stable home. I don't think it is as obvious as people would like to make it believe. I think. When you try to say, well, women have these natural impulses or whatever, that doesn't seem to make much sense. And I, I have found that every time someone does have to resort to natural arguments or biological arguments, it's because they don't know how to convince people otherwise, and that's a bad sign. So when you're asking who's good at child care, well, many people are good at child care. Some men are incredible at child care, and women, some women just aren't. Some people are very good at contributing something to their schools, and other people really aren't there's been a huge controversy over women's role in combat uh, in the military. And you have people insisting that, well, the way combat just works is that women can't be there. Well, first of all, we have to ask the question, what is the military doing right now? Should it be doing any of those things? And how <laughs> should it be doing any of those things? That's a bigger question. And if the, the, the answer is, well, you know, it's, it's all about this certain type of toughness and it's about these size requirements and all this, it's, what's so scary about asking whether or not those might be outdated? Why have we always assumed that the, the, the kinds of protective gear for soldiers should, should match certain requirements? Well, because we always assumed that men would be the ones fighting the wars. We've always assumed that maybe it was face-to-face -face types of combat, which we're really far away from now. Mm. So the unwillingness to rethink, you know, what is this institution actually doing? What's required here? Take any other job. I think um, firefighting, you know, being a police officer, all the things where people are still getting so angry that women might be entering these, these workforces. The question still remains, what do you think that, that's essential about being a cop or being a firefighter or being an MM, MMA fighter or whatever it is that you think excludes women as opposed to saying, see if these legitimate requirements are something that they can achieve. And if the answer is yes, what's your problem? What are you worried about? 
Well, it, yeah, huge, huge questions. And the, I mean, the the first, you know, just the, the first idea that comes to mind is, um, what are you, what are you worried about? You know, my identity is built into those uh, roles. I externalize my identity out to those things. And if you're talking about, I need to change it. You're talking about maybe I lose my stature in this whole thing. I think that's part of it. And I think it's also this kind of uh, zero-sum game approach that many people take that somehow if women are given, I don't even want to say women are given more opportunities, that we stop actually artificially handicapping women, which is really what we're talking about. If we stop actually restricting them in ways that we never restricted men, what will happen? Does that mean that all the power that's out there and all the, the, the status that's out there suddenly gets leached from men to, to, you know, to women like some sort of demonic possession type of thing? Hopefully the answer is no, but I think that what you're really seeing is that some men, and it's always just some men, who are worried that these fairly male-dominated areas, that's where their identity comes from. The fact that they could go and, and just be one of the boys and could have certain types of conversations and reinforce their own worldviews, that's what is being threatened. And that's something we should all just admit in many cases is what's going on. Why do you find that threatening? Why would the inclusion of women in this particular area bother you so much? What is it that you would be losing that's actually worth getting upset about? Hmm. You know, uh, my, my career background is in, you know, future trend analysis and um, telling people about, you know, a futurist, telling people about what's, what's coming next. And I eventually I got over the, um, the technical requirement, you know, collecting trend data and to managerial C-suite type tools for how do you figure out, you know, what these things all mean to your company. That stuff is pretty easy. What I, what I came to find was that the part that was really difficult was the emotional work, the psychological and sociological implications of, you know, talking about computer processing power or um, what uh, the internet means or what a, you know, get into demographics, I had a lot of freakouts over, um, and when I mean freakouts, I mean people that stopped the meeting and tossed me out into the street for bringing up aging populations. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the baby boomers, unless they get hit by lasers, are going to get older in mass. Just to merely state that thing that is demographically and mathematically certain mm -hmm. uh, was, you know, huge enough, you know, a psychological bomb enough to, to, to unhinge by the way, always men. <laughs> the men would become unhinged. But these guys would also become, and again, I'm sorry, I'm going to take this on my gender, it's, it's, it's always dudes. And 90% of the time it's older dudes. Um, that when you tell them about change and, and substantive change that requires a policy shift to, in order to make our institutions flexible enough to be able to handle what's coming down, the, the emotional role of that discussion, which never gets talked about, because um, it's embarrassing that you might be emotional in your scar. Remember, women are emotional in their discussions. Oh, yeah. Men are <laughs> rational. <laughs> um, as we've seen. As, we, as we've seen on something, I'm not even going to put up a link. If, they can, people, if people want to see that, uh, that circus, they can Google our names <laughs> together, and I'm sure they'll come up with something. But Because um, I just don't need traffic that bad. Uh, for this kind of thing, but the anytime you're going to tell the uh, some, what I came up to, my conclusion was anytime you tell, particularly men that are worried about their position in society, when you tell them that the world is going to in, involve a whole new set of information, mm -hmm. and we have an economy that's based on mastery of very technical information that takes a long time to accumulate, and it's you up and another guy down, when you have that kind of a of a situation. You know, you are talking about, when you tell someone about it, you're not telling them about how the economy is working. You're telling them about how they're going to lose their position. And that's when the, the emotions come up. And, you know, I, you know to loop this to back to the, the beginning of our conversation on violence, I think when you talk to guys who are on the lower end of the socioeconomic scale and they know they don't have too many um, options, you know, they reclaim their identity through violence, maybe. Um, and, you know, guys higher up in the hierarchy just simply refuse to, uh, imp you know, put, put policies in place that will allow our banks and universities to run, run effectively. But there's a, you know, as long as we have, uh, you know, as long as we have a society where men are very, very tied to their, their, uh, their status in society and their rank, and that rank comes through their, their employment and how much money they make very often. Anytime you're talking about shifting institutions around where maybe they're not as so 
delightfully important anymore uh, in that in that shift. As long as that's a terrifying, disrespectful thing that if you lose this position, pal, you're going back down the pyramid, and you know you, we don't talk about it, but you know what it's like down there. Um, it's funny, you know, maybe uh, one of the big issues in getting our uh, institutions to do what they need to do in the next few decades to get us through this okay will be m giving men hugs. Well, to, to be fair, I mean, I do think that there's, I think a lot of what is not usually cast as emotion is already emotion. So what what sometimes is cast as aggression or success or drive, well, these things are all emotional too. And when we look at male violence, as we were talking about before, this is all emotional too. We're talking about men who have felt rejected by women and they go on shooting sprees. I mean, that's incredibly emotional. That's incredibly vulnerable. We're talking about people who didn't feel that they were man enough and so they decided they would go buy a gun that was going to be some kind of substitute for their manhood. That's emotional. These are all emotional things. And so I think that only goes to show that that divide of saying women are the ones who are emotional, uh, you go back and look throughout all, all history, that is not the case at all. We've built our society around accommodating men's fragility, about their emotional incapacities in many ways. And now some of this is changing and then there's, there's a sense of rage and, and misdirection of all this. I want to, you know, make a plug here for rage. There is such, uh, you know, there are so many good reasons that people should be angry. There's so many good reasons that people ought to be angry if they really are looking at slipping down to the bottom because they didn't deserve to be at the bottom. They should get angry about that. They can't get angry about things that they didn't earn to begin with. They can't be angry about the fact that they have to fight for something just as hard as any woman has to fight or any minority has to fight. They can't get angry about those things because that's not legitimate. But they can get angry about the fact that the cards are stacked against your average citizen in so many different ways. That is worth getting angry about. And it's really important to figure out what the right targets are. Figure out why it is, if you really did work hard all of your life, why aren't you in a secure position? If you really have tried to be a good father, a good provider, a good husband, whatever it might be, why aren't things working out for you? Because the answer is never going to be because a woman you know, changed it for you. That's not what happened. It's because there are certain injustices in our society that we have not been willing to call out. And that we have to be careful about fetishizing the status quo, especially when it benefits us makes me think all the time about when I'm running for the bus and I'm late and I'm really praying that the bus driver is going to stop and let me on but as soon as I get on I'm like I hope he doesn't stop for anybody else because I'm late it's the same thing right I mean we all want the bus to stop for us but as soon as we're on we're like let's go we gotta get going and it's really <laughs> tempting to, to give into that impulse but we have to not give into that impulse because if there's a structural problem then we all need to be able to say that's the problem let's locate exactly who it is who's controlling this and why it's unfair not resting on some outdated notion of it's because I deserve this because of X, it's because there is really an injustice that I can articulate and can persuasively advance and then use my energies, my rage, my anger, my sadness, my um, whatever it might be in the right direction. Wow. And that, that lines up with, uh, with uh, my aforementioned friend, Dr. Sarah Kenzior, who says, you know, being angry is not a bad thing. Uh, it is better than complacency with injustice, but you're you're adding on as long as it's getting angry at the folks that are behind it, right? And the structures that are behind it, because as uh, you know, a lot of these institutions are built such that uh, um, accountability uh, is not uh, you know assignable to any one person. So they can go, well, it wasn't me, but you know, but that's man, you're you're getting at the uh, we've we we've gone from a, you know, an amusing anecdote about uh, trying to talk about this on a talk show and being um, and and being waylaid by a rather clownish and ridiculous figure. We've taken from from that type of discussion up to justice and how society changes and Aristotle. Man, we could either go another six hours and actually, I have to make dinner for my kids because <laughs> that's my role in society right now, Marianne. Where you, I mean, where else can we find your insights, which you have an innumerable amount of, and you're on sabbatical? Where can we get more Marianne Franks in the future? Well, I now have a blog, so I'm putting some of these things, some of these thoughts, into somewhat coherent form, at least. But I'm very, very new to it, so that's my caveat about this. But the blog is called Moving Targets, MarianneFranks.com. So anybody who's interested, please come and check it out. Always welcoming to people who want to email me and ask me about certain topics or about questions that they have. 
I've guest blogged on a lot of different sites, including concurring opinions. I've written some things in law review, uh, law review articles that probably five people have read up to this point. So if you'd like to make yourself a sixth person, that would be great. And I'm doing some media. I'm doing some interviews like this, trying to get people to talk about some of these really important issues. So um, find me. Excellent. And you're on the Twitter? I'm on the Twitter. I am M-A underscore Franks because there are apparently six other Marianne Franks is out there and they all took my Twitter handle. So I am M-A underscore Franks. That's not too bad. That's not too bad. Yeah. All right, Matt. Thank you so much for this. And uh, thank you for being with us today on the report. Thank you. All right. I'm happy to be here. Ciao. Thanks. Bye.